Welcome to Down Ancient Trails, the online archaeology forum of the Sharma Center for Heritage Education India. Brush the dust off long forgotten thoughts. Slice through time and space. Listen to stories in stone. Whispers of voices lost in time. Build bridges across worlds. Curious minds reach out to the past. And travel down ancient trails. Hello everyone, uh, from sunny and windy Crete. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present our exciting work uh, on uh, human evolution from this corner of the world that is famous for its classical and its Bronze Age heritage. Uh, so, what I'm going to talk to you about today is something that goes against the current uh, of archaeology in my home country. Um, it hasn't been easy, but it has been exciting. And uh, I hope you are going to share with me the excitement of these discoveries, but most importantly, of this journey, of this intellectual journey. So what today I'd like to present uh, to you is the Lower Paleolithic of Lesbos, with special attention given to Lisvori, the first site that uh, has produced compelling evidence for the presence of Achelian tool-using hominins in Greece. The typology, the technology, of lithic artifacts from the surface and the uh, uppermost uh, two units, as well as the first cluster of uh, OSL dates, place the site in the Middle Pleistocene, in the second half of the Middle Pleistocene. And my presentation, as I said earlier, is about uh, discovery, what we see um, on the ground and beneath the ground, um, but it is also about what we do not see, the hidden or the missing record. Uh, so it's a seminar about the bread and butter of archaeology, finds, contexts, dates, but it is also about ideas and this intellectual trip that has led to the discovery of this site and may lead in the future to more discoveries. It is also a seminar about the relation between official archaeology and the public. Uh, what in the last, say, 40 or 50 years is called public archaeology. Um, thus, it is also a seminar about the connection of our early human history to the modern history, to the modern society and the problems it faces today. Let's see how it's going to move. Ah, why is it there? So this is the um, um, spine of my talk, what guided our investigations in the islands, the methodology of research, the results. Uh, of the systematic work, the public archaeology component, and the paleogeographical component of our work, and the contribution that wishes to make to the early European uh, models of penetration and colonization. And let me uh, begin with the problem. Ten years ago, when I was planning to go out in the field and to conduct uh, my own work in the Paleolithic of Greece, I was faced with a dilemma. 
Should I follow the safe track and dig yet another cave site or should I follow a different track? Since its inception, uh, more or less a century ago, Paleolithic work in Greece and for the largest part of the 20th century, uh, it was founded upon a premise. And that premise um, identified as Greece equaling the Greek peninsula, what you see here. You can see my arrow pointing, right? My screen, yes. Um, Europe equals the European landmass. And I suppose, likewise, Asia, the Asian landmass. And please correct me if I'm wrong. There are so many uh, colleagues from Asia who may agree with me. Continental Greece was seen as the key area offering the best prospects for Paleolithic discovery. And mainland rivers, river valleys, caves, and karstic basins were the targets uh, explored during Paleolithic expeditions. Whereas the coastal areas and the islands of Greece were largely dismissed. And so was produced the map that you see on your screen um, that represents this, that depicts vividly this uneven picture of the Paleolithic world that comes from Greece. And it is heavily skewed to the Western part and of course to the mainland. It is also skewed towards the upper Pleistocene. So, we have a good number of Upper Paleolithic sites, mostly in caves, and let's say five or six times as many Middle Paleolithic ones. Reflecting disciplinary attitudes, the Mediterranean Sea that you see here was viewed as a barrier, as a barrier uh, peripheral to the Pleistocene world, and to the Pleistocene archaeology. And in this early research paradigm, it was the concept of separation that was implicitly attached to the Quaternary Sea. The uneven picture of the Paleolithic world that is uh, skewed towards the upper Pleistocene, I think, should be attributed to this paradigm. And what about the earliest record? Here you see the handful of um, dated um, and securely uh, contextualized lower Paleolithic sites. Some of them are highly contested. Um, Petralona, the one with the amazing skull, two more in the Peloponnese, and um, the Epidema uh, with conflicting uh, interpretations of the two hominin skulls. As a result, up to the early 21st century, the Paleolithic research in the Balkan Peninsula had not yielded any significant and properly contextualized lower Paleolithic records. And this situation can be seen on this um, uh, slide, uh, and it is illustrated in Olaf Jori's maps um, of the early European record, where Greece, um, both in the very early Pleistocene and the early Middle Pleistocene, is literally a black hole. And, um, this black hole continues in the next phase, and there was a mark, marked disparity. On the one hand, there was a rich and diverse paleontological evidence from this part of the world, from Greece, both animal and plant, suggesting a biodiversity hotspot, yet a very poor paleoanthropological and archaeological yield. Homo heidelbergensis, the Petralona 
uh, find, lived around Petralona Cave in the northern part of, of, of Greece, somewhere here um, in Macedonia, towards the end of the Middle Pleistocene, whilst the rest of the country, um, once in a while, the occasional handaks would pop in, uh, uh, but these typically came uh, from what were largely low integrity contexts and lacked controlled recovery procedures and reliable dates. So, as a result, our, uh, let me stay here for a while, as a result, our current models of the early penetration of Europe um, and of its later colonization, regular colonization events, stop at Anatolia. See the dots on the map. And Anatolia and the Caucasus in the east, or highlight the pros and the cons of the Maghreb to Iberia route in the west. The Iberian and the Italian peninsulas, the two southernmost peninsulas of um, Europe, of West Eurasia, um, had plenty of uh, sites, dates, a variety of uh, archaeological records, Yet, the easternmost peninsula of Europe um, and its southern tip is, this is the Balkan Peninsula and the southern part is Greeks and the Aegean region, as we, we call it, um, was barren. So, the early prehistory of Europe um, can be uh, described as a seashore. The balance was thrown off as the archaeological and the paleoanthropological finds raised the western part and the central peninsulas and left the record of the Balkan Peninsula uh, on the side. So my work departed from this imbalance and this seashore phenomenon and in order to come to grips with the role of the southeast part of Europe in human evolution, there was a need, in my view, a need of a new paradigm. In fact, there are multiple alternative paradigms that one could work with, and I chose to work on the coastal areas, the islands, and the submerged landscapes, as I shall be explaining shortly. Because Greece is a maritime country with an intricate and extensive uh, coastline around 17,000 kilometers long, boasting 3,500 islands and island clusters, and the Greek coastline corresponds to a quarter of the total extent of sites in the Mediterranean, the entire Mediterranean basin. Um, and having worked in the limestone country and the karstic settings of the mainland, um, when it came to designing my own project and making this decision about the track that I had to follow, I chose to work in the islands, and I chose Lesbos that you see here, um, the third largest island of Greece, um, not far from the western coast of um, Anatolia on the 39th parallel. Lesbos geography shares similarities with some of the volcanic geographies of East Africa uh, and other parts of the world and was blessed, as you can see here, with two large basins. In the upper part of the slide, you can see um, the Ingnimbrides and the geothermal springs present on site, near the site, 
thanks to um, the island's volcanic history. Um, this volcanic history dates back to the Miocene. And in the bottom line, you see the bottom uh, slide on the right, you see the two shallow enclosed gulfs. Kaloni Gulf is the largest and Yera Gulf. Both embayments are connected to the sea through shallow straits. During the Pleistocene glacial periods, both gulfs were exposed well above sea level and were gradually becoming freshwater lakes. When we began field work in, on Lesbos, this was a hypothesis, a working hypothesis, which is now supported by marine geological data obtained by means of seabed mapping of the colony and of selected areas in southern Lesbos. So in addition to uh, the volcanic landscape, which, which comes with um, um, lithic raw materials, igneous raw materials, a complex topography close to the site, and a variety of survival possibilities associated with these two basins and the lacustrine water resources um, that were present or Lesbos. What you see on this slide is today's picture, uh, the opening in the upper slide to the sea, and in the bottom right, the salt ponds that are near the site where we work and the small rivers and seas along the streams that flow into the Kaloni Cal Gulf uh, in a highly productive flatbed plain all along the coastal zone. I have to say that the area where we work is the uh, combines uh, salt ponds, semi-salty marshlands, various wetlands, and um, uh, all these uh, habitats, all these are the habitats of a variety of aquatic and avian life and is the bird watchers uh, paradise and ultimate destination, one of the ultimate destinations in Greece. The geology of the island um, in the wider area of the, uh, of, uh, the site where we work, there are uh, Middle Miocene volcanic rocks, uh, Pliocene Marly lacustrine limestones, and Quaternary deposits. Um, and these three types seem to prevail. Uh, quaternary deposits are not too widespread. They are fairly abundant on the south and uh, the east part of the island, as you can see here. Um, consisting mainly of clastic fluvial deposits. The immediate vicinity of the site, that is somewhere here, um, and the nearby Polychnitos have two of the nine thermal springs of the island. Uh, you can see them here and there, and this is where the site, the Echelian site is. And the nearby Polychnitos and Vatera, this is Vatera and Polychnitos is here, have yielded a rich paleontological record. This comes from uh, seven fossiliferous sites. It is um, that uh, are not more than uh, 12 kilometers away from the uh, lower Paleolithic site, and they have yielded uh, rich Villafranchian paleonto paleontological uh, re record fauna uh, that consists of 15 uh, mammal taxa, uh, including a primate, a giant macaque, and can be characterized as continental, reflecting. Lesbos proximity to Anatolia and to the Asian mainland. So by now, you must have formed a good idea of the broader setting, the island setting, the geography, the geology, the resources that are today available. And uh, on Lesbos are 
work is focused on the largest gulf, on the Caloni Gulf, uh, seen here. Uh, and it began as work at Rodafniria. If you see me, I have a dog here. My dog is seeking my attention. So if, if I move, uh, it's my dog who's trying to, to, to catch my attention. There's nothing wrong. So uh, our work on Lesbos began at uh, Rodafniria. So that's why our early publications um, are uh, referred to Rodafnidia uh, from the Oleanders uh, that were once uh, uh, blossoming in the site. Uh, but we soon came to realize uh, Rodafnidia uh, is the toponym, Lisvori is the nearest uh, village. So we soon came to realize that um, Lisvori hosts uh, a very complex network of sites. So we are changing our name um, and uh, rather than referring to Rodafnidia, the project is the Paleolithic Lesbos project and um, it's the second component. It, it, the, the name of each site will be Lisvori, the first that refers to the village and we'll have Lisbori Rodafnidia, Lisbori Camara, Lisbori Lagada. There are different places around Lisbori that contain uh, Middle Pleistocene archaeology. So today we're going to talk about Rodafnidia but we are going to talk about the archaeology around um, Lisvori as well. The first period of our work, our work began there in uh, 2012, concentrated on the core find locality that is uh, Rodafnidia. Rodafnidia um, is situated at 40 meters above sea level and um, it is on a spur of a low hill delimited by two streams which flow into the Caloni Gulf. You can see the Caloni Gulf here. This is the hill. Um, the south and west sides of the hill being made up of ignibrites are rather steep and rocky, forming a small gorge. We are going to see that in the next slide. And the north side of the hill presents a smooth relief, goes there, um, uh, a gentle enough slope covered now with olive trees. You can see them here. Um, the hill where the core of the site is, is now segmented uh, into numerous properties where the local people cultivate their um, olives. Uh, here you can see the ignimbrite uh, outcrops that form the rather steep cliff and here is the site, right? This is the cliff here and here is one of the two streams that define the site. Um, near the site, very close to the site, in fact, and um, uh, there is a thermal spring. I pointed on the map earlier on. And uh, actually, it's unfair to say near the site because uh, Achillean archaeology is also found right by the thermal spring, um, which is an element that needs to be taken into account. And here is again the larger picture. Um, this is the, the hill. Here comes the river and goes like this, like this, and the bout is there. These are the Polychnito salt pans. The picture I showed you earlier with the flamingos comes from here. It's at the distance of less than uh, 1.5 kilometers. And here on the one boundary uh, of the site, 
uh, are the um, thermal springs of Lisvori. Um, the river is Glyphias, it's got brackish water that comes from the local thermal spring. Um, so since um, 2012, we began uh, archaeological investigations in the Caloni Gulf, and this investigation takes place as part of our undergraduate and MA curriculum to train students at archaeological field methods. So Paleolithic Lesbos is uh, of educational as well as of uh, is a, an educational as well as a research project. And our strategy to explore the lower Paleolithic archaeology has an on-site and an off-site component. Fieldwork develops in a triptych. It begins with archaeological surface survey that you see on this slide. And in the red, it is the core, it's the tall, it's the hill, the spur, as it is defined by the two streams, it's the core area of the uh, finds. Um, so um, archaeological surface surveys, it is used uh, to identify uh, archaeology on the surface. Um, And as can be seen here, the archaeology on the surface uh, is uh, um, extends over a wide area. Uh, and there's always a number of enthusiastic students willing to be trained in uh, surface survey. Uh, so we conduct intensive surface survey in every expedition and gradually expand the area explored. Um, and as you can see uh, in this distribution map, um, there is a gradient in the density uh, and the largest number comes from what we call the, the core of the site. But it is also, you can observe the difference in the um, um, elevation is the lowermost part of the surveyed area. Um, and I think there is also a bias. Um, well, there are, this is the core site, but also this is the site that has been, because it's very close at hand to the excavation trenches. Um, it has been surveyed uh, repeatedly, many times. So it's, it's natural that we have high um, numbers, large numbers of high frequencies of large cutting tools and or paleolithic artifacts. Um, the second component, the second ptich of the tribe ptich um, is um, exploratory. And we open test pits and longer trenches and deeper trenches to expose the latter to expose the large geological sections at key locations, allow sedimentological and geological sampling, and refine the preliminary geological interpretation of the site. Um, during these explorations, um, we um, identify um, those units, those layers that are worth investigating. And as you can see here, um, 2015, we explored, um, we opened the trench 20. Trenches have Latin numbers. Units, stratigraphic units have um, um, uh, European numbers. Um, so, we discovered uh, a channel and uh, the year, a year later, we opened, we decided to open a large excavation in, uh, in this channel. 
So test pitting and the deep trenches guide us to the geometry of the site and to selecting the areas where archaeological excavation proper has to take place. Um, test pits were informative, especially in the first two years of, of, of our work in the field, when we were familiarizing ourselves with the origin of the Achillean artifacts. And what we were doing was that we had couples, pairs of students, one student digging, one assistant outside, one by one test pits, um, placed regularly every 20 meters so that we could um, test an extensive area find out uh, what was beneath it. Um, you can see these little test pits here. These are the first two years when we uh, followed this field strategy. We took um, a continuous stripe of land at the highest part of the, of the hill. Uh, to make sure that we can control, we go deep, uh, and every 20 meters we opened um, some test pits. The longer ones are the um, uh, exploratory trenches. And um, um, through this strategy, we came to understand where the surface material that brought us to the site in the first place came from. And um, um, here you can see um, the, um, here is the site, uh, the quaternary se sediments, that's the, the nearest village, Lisbori. The site is by the thermal spring and the next thermal spring is here. Um, so, since 2012, between 2012 and 2019, um, we have worked through test pitting and exploratory trenching, but we have also the third component of our work, which is archaeological excavation proper. So, in areas that we consider that there are um, layers um, containing uh, archaeology, uh, we conduct archaeological excavation to expose horizontally the archaeology bearing units. And we have thus far worked on four such trenches in the south and the northern sector of the site. The site is divided, this is the south, this is the north, by a truck, a dirty road here. It, it comes handy. So you can see how extensive the site is. You can see um, how we began uh, a little bit scratching the surface in uh, 2013 and continued uh, later on um, in 2014. Um, one more year going further deep. At uh, the same year, we opened a much deeper trenching, trench, trench seven, which at the time we were again excavating. It was down to 2.6, 2.7 meters deep. We were exca excavating this um, conglomerate that yielded uh, much archaeology. And at that time, we thought we were digging the, um, uh, an earlier, uh, a deeper uh, conglomerate. I will explain later on when I show you the stratigraphic uh, column. Um, and um, here you can see our strategy, this is a summary of our strategy in this gem. Um, this is the, the continuous stripe, and I'm not sure whether you can see the little dots are the test pits and the larger, longer um, 
um, exploratory trenches. So the results, what have we found? Uh, six sedimentary units, units um, uh, one to six have been identified above the weathered bedrock and uh, the unaffected bedrock proper. And uh, in effect, we find matrix supported conglomerates. And these are units one, three, five, sitting on top of mats, of mud units two, four, and six. Um, the lowermost red-brown mud sits above, above uh, this is the lowermost and sits above the weather bedrock. Uh, the topsoil units one, three, five contained archaeology, whilst the units two, four, and six were barren. The lithology, lithology suggests a relatively small alluvian plain, which represents the depositional environment of the artifact. Two types of deposit are distinguished. We have the floodplain sediments, two, four, and six. Uh, and these are red to red-brown muds with mud cracks filled with carbonates. And sometimes we see them uh, because of the carbonate, carbonate content. We think they are white, but they are brown, red, and they are filled uh, with the carbonates. And the fluvial deposits are the conglomerate accumulations uh, of units one, three, and five. And these characterize a fluvial network, be it a river or a stream that shifted its course over time. It was eroding, forming new riverbeds that cut through the floodplain sediments and deposited during older which were, had been deposited during the older flood events. And this picture can be made in most of our trenches, but that's because we had test pitted and it had explored a wide area. Um, uh, there was one special um, test pit that gave us a different uh, picture uh, this is closer to the present-day Caloni Gulf shore, and here we could see green clay um, indicating the presence of a still freshwater deposit, a pond, a marsh, perhaps a small oxbow lake. Uh, that again has to do with the um, fluvial system, with the river uh, changing its course and. Uh, um, producing this effect. Um, what I should say is that the presence of such still freshwater bodies is uh, a common feature alongside fluvial systems uh, developing across fluvial plains and uh, it was quite informative to see um, a Rella's seminar um, last seminar she was talking she was working in a similar uh, context, of course, in a different period. Geological samples have been um, extracted. We have sampled and uh, they are currently being analyzed, aiming to obtain um, absolute and uh, relative dating uh, dates. Uh, relative dates through microfaunal and stratigraphic uh, identification. Um, absolute dates through OSL, we tried TCN, didn't give much, it wasn't happy, and paleomagnetism that gave us results that place us in the um, middle Pleistocene. So uh, four of the samples um, were submitted to the luminescence dating suit of the Laboratory of Archaeometry at uh, Democritus in Athens and post-infrared uh, stimulated luminescence returned measurements that place um, the upper part of the sequence, that is the first 2.8 meters between 475 and 160,000 years um, ago. 
And here you can see the um, dates, the first cluster of dates, and I have placed them here in this stratigraphic column. Um, what we should bear in mind is that the ages obtained for the sediments are minimum ages for the archaeological finds, and they refer to the uppermost um, part of the Rhodafnidia sequence. Um, diagnostic lower Paleolithic artifacts uh, were present in the channel fields of units one, three, and five, and we have only dated thus far units one and two. And we are expecting more finds. We have sent samples. Um, due to the recession, we had to adapt uh, and uh, change our, um, um, our collaborations and the new sample uh, of dates is expected to come from the University of Adelaide and Lee Arnold. The fine-grained units, two, four, and six, must have been deposited during an interglacial period when sea level was significantly higher and the climate was wet enough with increased precipitation. And the reason I have placed, although we are digging uh, at trend seven, unit three, which is a conglomerate, it's a fluvial deposit. The reason I have put uh, these slides is because you can see the fluvial deposit uh, lies beneath a floodplain deposit that can be seen here and here. The coarse grain deposits, units one, three, and five, represent sediments that were deposited during uh, high energy events of glacial periods when sea level was lower and the climate was drier. And we assume that during MIS 13, the Rhodafnidia area was located closer to um, what is today the sea, closer to what is today the Caloni Gulf, but let's call it the Caloni Basin, uh, or the Paleo uh, uh, Lake of Caloni, representing a floodplain environment where marshes and temporary ponds would develop, allowing the presence of freshwater dwellers, harophytes uh, and gastropods, to develop, to, to live. Conversely, during glacial periods, Rhodafnidia became an elevated inland area, erosional process would dominate. Fluvial systems would first develop eroding the substrate, which in this case would be the sediments of unit two. And these fluvial channels would be consequently filled by fluvial coarse grain deposits of unit one that we excavate here. And unit one might also represent um, coarse grain fluvial deposits that were deposited in different fluvial networks formed during two different glacial periods. I re remind you that these are the fine bearing sediment, sediments and the artifacts must have been accumulated originally in older sediments and units, uh, possibly older than MIS 13, and were ero that were eroded upstream and were carried downstream to Rhodafnidia to this alluvial floodplain through the fluvial channels to where they were finally deposited and are recovered uh, through archaeological excavation. Um, this um, is one of the archaeologically excavated trenches, trench six. Uh, we have explored unit one here. 
uh, it's the upper conglomerate in this uh, trench. And um, it is a channel that can be seen that has a southeast northwest orientation. And from this channel, uh, amongst other finds, came the biface that you see here. Um, uh, and this is worked on a very large flake removed from a giant core. And amongst other finds, this is one, um, a very characteristic uh, hand axe that has affinities with the large flake Achillean. The industry. The artifacts recovered from controlled excavations and from systematic field walking from surface survey around the excavated fields. And uh, as you saw, uh, you may remember the earlier distribution map uh, over a wide area around Lisvori and around the Kaloni Gulf clearly demonstrates the presence of Achillean groups at Lisvori at the Kaloni Basin. The archaeological material is stratified within fluvio lacustrine deposits and one of its industrial components, one of its industrial components has very close affinities with the large flake Achillean, like those recovered from Caletepe de Resi 3 and GBY, Geser Benut Yaakov, uh, in the Jordan River. Kalete uh, Bederesi 3 is in uh, central Anatolia, some 700 kilometers away from Lesbos. Um, as I said, here you can see another hand axe coming out of the fluvial deposit again at trend 6 in 2015, and um, overall, a picture of our finds, what you can see is the, you know, a random photograph in the background from the table of our laboratory. Uh, so our database currently records to, to, to uh, 151 uh, lower paleolithic artifacts and many, many more small artifacts. Uh, this, this table contains the large diagnostic tools. Um, this work is uh, ongoing work, the study of the lithics, so it's not published and uh, it's not publishable and it's not reproducible, so uh, please do not uh, uh, this is ongoing work, it's the current state of affairs uh, and the artifacts are under study. So we have 251 Lower Paleolithic diagnostic finds from the excavation and from the surface, uh, bifaces, hand axes, cleavers, unifaces, trihedrals, as well as other tools and cores, as well as a larger number of napstone artifacts of smaller size. Um, hand axes, our database uh, records whole hand axes and tips of hand axes, broken tips, and they both total 98, two more, and we reach the 100 hand axes uh, threshold. Um, dozen uh, unifaces. Uh, there are also 10 examples of uh, peaks of trihedrals. You can see one here. And two of them were found uh, down below at the lowermost units of Rodafnidia in unit 5 that we want to excavate. And we will, uh, we hope to be able to excavate. We haven't excavated yet because it's uh, five meters deep. So we have to um, purchase land, cut olive trees in order to be able to go safely down to five meters. We have only gone, go down to 2.7, 2.8 meters thus far. Um, so um, 
there are also rough outs, as you can see in the bottom here, um, as well as other uh, examples of, uh, of large scrapers, um, cleavers. Um, and let me stop a little while here on the cleaver component of the industry. Um, our database records 38 examples of cleavers. Almost all are made on flake blanks. And the majority of these flake, flakes are stride, side struck. Uh, we also have four cleaver flakes, like this one you see here. And you may remember on the table I showed you earlier, there were cleavers question marks. And in this group, we classify cases like these, um, which um, look like cleavers. They have the cleaver bit, but they must have been transformed uh, hand axes. They must have had a prior life, an earlier life as hand axes. Um, what is special about the industry of uh, Rodafnidia is this very exceptionally high percentage of cleavers and cleaver flakes. Uh, they make one fifth of the total of large cutting tools of the site. And um, um, there are uh, what we call the African element of the Rodafnidia uh, industry. And um, it is also um, a quantitative element as well as a technological element, a qualitative element that makes the industry uh, interesting. Um, and this is the uh, blanks used. They prepare the blanks specifically for transport, transforming them into uh, cleavers. Um, I would say that uh, some of our uh, cleavers are made on um, pre-prepared flake blanks and are closer in concept to um, the technologically defined GBY cleavers uh, than to other non-technologically uh, defined assemblages elsewhere in the Near East. And cleavers in such a high frequency are not encountered in the Anatolian Achillean. Um, and the flaking away of the proximal area, um, accompanied by some thinning and shaping of the formal distal end of the blank to form the cleaver sides, is particularly diagnostic in the cleavers of our sample. Um, here you saw, uh, in the previous slide, you saw a comparison. It was Gonen Sharon taking a cleaver out of the Jordan River during our visit to the site when Nama Gorenimbar was kind enough to show me the site and the finds. Um, beyond uh, hand axes and, um, and uh, cleavers, um, we also have retouched flakes, such as scrapers, such as the one you can see here, uh, denticulates, uh, retouched points, and uh, other finds. And some of them uh, share similarities with sites, with lithics, with stone tools from sites in Africa. The question of um, size. I don't remember who it was uh, who mentioned that. I think Shanti had mentioned that in one of the earlier seminars, uh, referring to something that John Gowlett had told us in the uh, Lower Paleolithic size group meeting at Jerusalem two or three years ago, uh, when she mentioned that every, every Achillean assemblage has its own little things 
Uh, um, axis exhibits impressive variability in size and in the blanks used to produce them. And here you can see one example. Um, uh, of um, of uh, this variation in, 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 in size, a large and a small one. Um, and uh, uh, let's move on to see what the blanks, where the blanks come from. Um, we have excavated, we have recovered um, some large, I would call them giant cores. Um, however, none of them has come from the excavated trenches. They are all surface finds. And it's exciting to know that these were all used by the local um, people who work on land as aid to agricultural activity. Um, now, although there is much variability in the size of the artifacts, uh, there is not much variability in the raw materials used to, to nap, uh, to produce the finds. Uh, as Eli Karkazi uh, has shown in her PhD work, um, in this PhD, that's the first PhD that came out from material from uh, Paleolithic Lesbos and other sites in Greece. In this PhD, she examined the strategies of lithic resource acquisition and usage. Uh, it was submitted to the University of Crete. We are very proud. Uh, training Paleolithic specialists. Um, so what's Ellie has found is that it is not igneous rocks, it is not taps and bustles uh, that uh, make the, the, they are not the preferable uh, rocks. Uh, this make only 10% of the preferred um, uh, uh, rocks used to nap uh, and produce the, the artifacts, the lower Paleolithic artifacts, uh, but it is church. Three types of chert, uh, cherts of um, cinder origin that make uh, almost a little above 80% of the large cutting tools. And on the right slide here, you can see a close-up uh, photograph of uh, chert with plant fossils suggestive of uh, hydrothermal environment uh, in a geyser type swamp setting where cinder deposits of high porosity and enriched in fossilized remains of plants um, can be turned into this preferred raw material. Um, a medical doctor who is uh, um, uh, who has who had first discovered the site, Mike is axiotic, axiotis, um, and share the information, this nice information with us before uh, we and invited us to, to, to examine the site. Uh, has worked, he's uh, one of these uh, Renaissance uh, uh, people who do many things. He's uh, an antiquarian, a botanist, a medical doctor, a painter. So Makis has helped us to identify as a botanist um, the plant, the species, and this is a Quisetum ramusissimum, which is one of these plants that even today are um, encountered near the Thurban Springs, and they are typical of the, these volcanic uh, geographies. Um, the lithic industry was napped, as I said, on three different types of church, and to a much, much lesser extent, we had uh, a component of uh, tufts, antecedent tufts, and basalts. 
I will not get into much detail on that because I want you to look up for Ellie's work. I want to show you, however, some of the finds because um, uh, they are exciting, not only for their technology, but because some of them, some of the church that are preferred uh, are fossiliferous and they contain macro or micro fossils and some of them present gastropods as the one you can see here on the, uh, on the right. What is exciting and interesting and makes the research on this industry exciting is that um, it, it, it invites us to reconsider uh, the so-called African pattern and the role of igneous and metamorphic rocks as the criterion to its definition. Um, uh, the Achelian, large flake Achelian of Rodafnidia is not made on uh, volcanic rocks. It is made on church. And um, I don't think this has to do with the uh, date of the site because um, uh, we know that Shirts are widely used in Europe and in other parts of the world uh, during the later parts of the Lower Paleolithic. But uh, here, the Achelian nappers of Lesbos uh, know that there are outcrops of shirts. Um, they are not like tufts, but they are Loosely, they are linked to the volcanic history of the island. Um, yet, it's their preferred um, rock. But they use large flake uh, Achelian. Um, uh, we have the African component that uh, contains high proportions of cleavers. So, uh, it is as if Rodafnidia represents, uh, how shall I put it? I would say a transitional site, a site that contains two different elements. An element from the African past and takes it towards the European um, um, sort of habit of um, napping church and of course this is something that we shall be uh, exploring more in the future. I know from other seminars that much of the many of the people who are in the audience are very much interested in finding out about the sourcing of uh, raw materials and the sources of all rock types have been identified um, during prospection that was conducted in the context of the project and the Ellis PhD. And they are situated in a local radius of less than three kilometers, uh, around 2.7 kilometers around the site. And they are commonly outcropped as layers, nodules or fracture fillings. And um, they are also abundant as secondarily, sec secondary fluvial lacustrine breccia conglomerate deposits in the broader area of the site. Um, one question that remains is what drove the Achelian tool using hominins of Lesbos to the selection of the, of the church, um, uh, especially chair type one, uh, to be the dominant raw material, and we promise to come back and publish more about that. So having presented um, uh, what drove us to the site, the questions, um, the methodology, and the major findings, let me now share with you 
uh, another passion of mine beyond Paleolithic archaeology, um, our work to empower a local community to engage with its Paleolithic heritage. As I told you in the beginning, uh, Paleolithic work, Paleolithic specialization is not self-evident in the Greek context, in the context of Greek archaeology, because they are wonders of classical Greece, they are wonders of the Bronze Age. Why waste your time with stone tools? So, um, I have been like an evangelist of Paleolithic archaeology in Greece, and um, the way we approach the community, the local community and the public in this uh, particular project, I think is um, exemplifies my approach to change the attitude of uh, my fellow citizens uh, towards the early stone age and the archaeology of human evolution. Now, let me tell you what we have done and how we have approached the very fine uh, issues of addressing and dealing with the local community. The site is extensive and my team has made deliberate choice to explore different parts of it. You saw the distribution maps. Uh, by digging only in those properties whose owners had granted us permission. The people's consensus to authorize excavation was deemed a prerequisite to research and thus far a total of 35 archaeological trenches, uh, trenches, not test pits, have been explored in 21 properties owned by people poor people living in their nearby villages. At the end of its field season, the trenches are backfilled, and you can see in these four slides the process of backfilling, and the plots are returned to their owners to carry on with their agricultural activity. The most significant test pits or trenches are and the archaeological trenches to which we return every year are uh, backfilled with polyesterine blocks. You can see them here and um, geotextile. Uh, and um, in this way, whenever, and of course they are recorded using total station and uh, GIS. So whenever we want to return to them, they are immediately accessible. Um, so, in this slide, you can see um, how we protect an important six meter long uh, section before backfilling it. And um, in this way, we have been successful in incorporating our archaeological work and activity into the annual cycle of village life. We are in a rural area of Greece, uh, low-income area of Greece, uh, badly hit by the recession that began in 2009, and uh, there is another one coming ahead of us due to the pan pandemic. So we go there, we respect the property, we do our work, uh, we communicate with the owners, and we have been successful to even leave our mark uh, beneath the soil, beneath the surface, and uh, being able to access it whenever we need it. Now, I'm saying all this because I want you to bear in mind that the Greek public views archaeology with an attitude of subversion and fear of loss or freezing property. And uh, the project, uh, was conducted by non-locals. We are the University of Crete, a university, not the University of the Aegean, that is on Lesbos. Uh, we come for a, from a far-flung university. And um, over the years, we have, uh, through an all-inclusive approach to the community, we have been successful to address this reservation of the local community and um, 
we have brought about a remarkable shift uh, in a different attitude. The public program embraces the village people, the immediate neighbors and the islanders of, of Lesbos, both those living on the island and in Athens and all over the world, and the structure in two phases. During its film season, citizens of all ages and backgrounds, from school children to local fishermen, medical doctors, tourists, or even clergy, as we can see here, are encouraged to visit and when possible to participate uh, in the excavation, and they are always supervised by a senior team member. It's exciting to see that uh, uh, human evolution research is getting on very well with the local clergy. Um, who respects? You see their heritage. They see it as heritage, and there is no conflict. The head of the village, of the village council, is this gentleman here. And this is his assistant. He always comes with an assistant. He's encouraged to be daily in the trenches. He oversees the progress of work. He helps us carry and maintain the excavation equipment. As you can see, we don't use workers. We, it's only students and um, uh, researchers who conduct the excavation. And uh, he's always present. Um, and working next to us. Every evening, the archaeology lab, which is housed in the local primary school, is open to everyone interested in seeing the yield of the day. And they help us watch the finds, simply want a friendly chat. They are welcome to come. Sometimes they are annoying, but we bear with this. Those who come to the lab obtain, have obtained a hands-on experience of Paleolithic artifacts and we encourage them to bring in objects found in the fields when the archaeological team is absent. And in this way, we have discovered new sites because they expect us. They work during the winter, during the spring and during the autumn and they carry handbags, plastic bags full of, 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 of hand axes and point us new areas to work and explore. Uh, so those who contribute to the discovery are praised and are given uh, further information on their finds. They follow the biography of the finds that they have discovered when they are published and so on. So in this way, they become, they encourage to become active participants in the archaeological discovery and provide really valuable information on unknown sites. Before closing the trenches, there is an annual opening, almost annual, we are trying, we are tired, we are tired to death before closing, but this is something that has been incorporated in the protocol of excavation, you know, the annual open meeting with the local community. Here we are in the courtyard of the, of the school, of the primary school, where we share the results of our work. And here's the former mayor of, of the Lesbos, of the island, and behind is the local council headman, uh, who is the, uh, has been appointed as the vice director of the project. Uh, he's the second one in the order, in the hierarchy. So this is an event that unites the different gender and age groups of the local community who has different areas. They especially uh, segregate in different areas. The men's domain is the local agora, the cafes, whereas the, the women cluster in the outskirts of the village um, in a, a children's playing ground. So they are gathered together uh, and uh, they exchange views with us, we exchange feelings, we alleviate tensions and confrontation, and we openly discuss problems encountered by the team, and also together plan the fundraising plan and the communication strategies of our team. We listen to them, they listen to us. 
Once the field work is over, the communication thread is maintained through press releases in the local and national press, TEDx presentations, radio and television interviews, oral presentations of the findings, and senior members of the team share the canon of their discipline as well as the uncertainties and difficulties encountered during research in the field. The members of the community respond by taking active part in this archaeological journey, seeing the finds as part of their own identity and heritage. They now share with the archaeological team the anthropocentric and ecumenical view of the past unveiled by Paleolithic archaeology. Remember, we compete with the classical wonders, with the wonders of the classical past. They often envision hand axes as the smartphones of prehistoric people, multi-purpose tools that fit in one's hand and contain the technological achievements of uh, half a million years ago. The archaeological narrative about the Paleolithic dispersals to Lesbos is also a means of linking the past with the present. And in recent years, due to its close proximity to the Anatolian coast, Lesbos has assumed the major burden of the refugee and immigrant wave after the Syrian war. The archaeological narrative that the findings at Glisbori Rodafnidia are a testimony to the origins and the roots of human dispersals and migrations in this part of the world helps place the recent wave in a deep historical perspective. And as a result of this public program, a relationship of mutual trust has been established. The local community and the Lesbos people not only welcome the archaeological team, providing accommodation in their homes, but people even ask why excavations have not yet been conducted on their own plots, which is amazing. The community has gained respect for its own heritage through physical interaction with the site, the finds, and our working team. Moreover, we all share the dream of giving Lisvori Rodafnidia a brand name and turning it into a place that will keep its young people at home, allowing, allowing them a dignified life by means of a sustainable economy. They share with us the vision of turning the old the village's old oil press into a Paleolithic Heritage Information Center to complement the outdoor visit to the site. This dual destination scheme is expected to attract visitors and act as a core of local economic and cultural identity. And it will also boost the primary sector, which includes small-scale yeah, small yields of amazing quality, high-quality chickpeas, onions, wheat, anise, cumin, sardines, and salt. And this interaction has helped us, the academic team, teachers and students alike, to realize the imperative need of archaeologists to gain exposure as a community through their multifaceted meeting with society and to transform this peculiar introversion into a social and public good. We dig Rodafnidia and we gain academic capital, but that's not enough for our project. To experience the liberating osmosis of the fascinating archaeological adventure together with society. And the engagement with the public, with the local communities of Lesbos, is not a research priority uh, for us, but a genetic trait 
of the University of Great work on Lesbos. Let me finish now with some more exciting archaeology and see how our work contributes to understanding the early um, East-West Eurasian movements dispersal. The importance of our site, Rodafnidia, this is an early map, it's now Lisboa Rodafnidia, lies in um, the time and duration of hominin presence in the size of the entire size, because the Achillean site is extensive, um, and the geography of the site, which has a critical element to it, both on a local scale, um, in a fluvial lacustrine environment in the Caloni Basin, uh, right by geothermal springs, and on a regional scale that we see here, with its very prominent geographic position on the border of two continents and at the heart of Eurasia. The proximity of Lesbos to Anatolia makes Rodafnidia a key site in the attempt to comprehend both hominin migration into Europe and also of the Achillean occupation northwards and uh, northwards of the Jordanian Rift Valley. Rodafnidia, bridges, West Asia and Southeast Europe, and lends itself to exploring the role of these two key Eurasian regions, either as areas of penetration and stasis, or as mere passageways in hominin dispersals during the Middle Pleistocene. So now let me return to where I started my presentation. We saw that until the end of the 20th century, uh, the lower Paleolithic map of Greece featured very few sites. And uh, um, this paucity of evidence has not only an epistemological background. I mean, I refer to the research priorities and intensity or the theoretical paradigms and field strategies to which I referred earlier the focus on caves and cave sites and karstic basins, but it also has a geological background. And the latter is directly associated with the landscape dynamics and the active tectonics prevailing in the Aegean region since the Miocene and affecting negatively the preservation and accessibility to uh, the early and the middle Pleistocene material. So, Lisvori Rodafnidia invites us to explain it and think about it moving beyond the successful finds and the excitement of studying them, publishing them, scanning them, illustrating them, photographing them. So, the Middle Pleistocene uh, hominins of Lesbos were repeatedly visiting this favorable setting on the banks on small streams and channels near outcrops of Ingrim Bride and close to the thermal springs and near a large paleo lake. They are assumed to have come from Eurasian mainland, the mainland right to the east using land bridges that, as you can see in this map, to the east and the north, northeast, um, the same land bridges were used by the game herds that had already been on Lesbos since the early Pleistocene, and they were going very close to, to the site, um, and perhaps even earlier. Remember, I showed you the Villa Francian uh, fauna recover very close to the site. 
The question that arises is whether the large numbers of Lord Paleolithic artifacts at Lisvori are due to the abundant resources available, available to the area, some kind of a garden of Eden for the Achillean to use in hominins, or a population bottleneck occurring following episodes of sea level rise, episodes that cut the terrestrial land bridges to and fro the Asian mainland. Um, and thus confining the hominins to what was then becoming the island of Lesbos that we see today. During those periods, herds and hominins could neither return to Asia nor advance to the land of Lesbos, uh, beyond the land of Lesbos, to the south or to the west, feeding a productive chain of hominin survival, at least in the early stages. We suspect that between the Garden of Eden scenario and the isolation due to uh, the, insula, the new insular geography, um, the answer is probably somewhere uh, is to be found in combination of the two. Yet the lower Paleolithic archaeology of Lesbos, um, seen within the wider context outlined above, raises the pressing question of the role of the broader Aegean region in the early dispersals and colonization of Europe, especially when considering the recent advances in the prehistoric submerged uh, research. In 2009, Vasilis Likousis uh, comes from the background, he's a geologist, a marine geologist, proposed the reconstruction of sea level changes in the Aegean Basin for the most pronounced glacial periods of the last 400, uh, say 500,000 years. From his work, a testable hypothesis about the Aegean paleogeography has emerged and according to this hypothesis, the northern part of the Aegean, this is the northern part of the Aegean, say this is Lesbos and this is the northern Aegean. Um, the northern part of the Aegean um, was um, um, dry, dry land, during the glacial, as well as the early in the glacial stages of the middle Pleistocene. And it therefore provided uh, a viable, yet previously unrecognized migration route into mainland Greece and uh, West Eurasia and into Europe. Our group, collaborates with marine geologists from the National Center of Marine Research to test the Lucus' hypothesis. And here you see how it translates to the region of interest. We have refined the reconstruction of Lucus' by integrating evidence on the geology, tectonics, uh, morphology, and hydrogeology of the shallow coastal and shelf areas of the Aegean, of the entire Aegean region. We have divided the Aegean into nine smaller geographic sections with discrete characteristics each. And for each section, we have um, recorded the morphological and geological traits and the long-term tectonic movements um, uh, we have all thrown them into, into the um, reconstruction of the paleogeography. Um, and as we have produced a qualitative outline of the submerged basement out underlying thinly sedimented or shelf areas that are expected to have been exposed during one or more um, low sea level periods of the middle and the upper Pleistocene. 
This research has demonstrated the close relationship between the prevailing tectonic movements along major faults and the qualitative outline of the exposed land masses versus the long-term subsiding deposition areas. And it has provided a frame of reference to assess land routes and natural resources available to hominins at different times of the Pleistocene and allow the Aegean, the Aegean region to actively enter the discussion of um, uh, the early occupation of Europe via the southeastern uh, part of the continent. The Aegean, Aegean dry land hypothesis is starting to have an important impact on the archaeological thought. And to this, uh, an enormous contribution has been made by another former student of mine who has just completed her PhD thesis at the University of Southampton. This is Penny Chakaniku. Um, she defended her thesis uh, last year and she has been working on the paleogeography and um, bringing together uh, different lines of evidence using GIS techniques to reconstruct uh, and explore possible routes and areas of activity in the now submerged landscapes. She has also developed a methodology to unlock information kept with this type of dynamic context in the Aegean. And um, uh, in a paper that is coming out at Quaternary International next week, we have sent uh, the proof, so it should be any any time towards the end of next week, uh, online, available. Uh, we propose these different routes, these different routes uh, to enter the um, West Eurasia, to enter Europe through the Aegean, uh, following in Anatolia the main river basins, the rivers where the um, national roads, the high roads of the Paleolithic, the river valleys were the high roads of the Paleolithic groups, um, and following these uh, three uh, possible routes when the sea levels of the middle Pleistocene and perhaps of the early Pleistocene, we are working to further refine these models um, uh, where uh, sea levels were dropping and land bridges were opening. So from all his work, it remains open whether the robust Archelian signal from Lesbos has to do with this bottleneck effect, uh, or it was indeed uh, a Garden of Eden. Um, but what matters and what I want you to keep out of this long seminar is that the work of the University of Crete in the Northeast Aegean is in constant interaction and dialogue with the research on sea level fluctuation. Our archaeological work springs from questions of history, of historical nature, but the conceptual framework of our work is based on three pairs of notions, connectivity and separation, dispersal and adaptation, travel and stasis. As pairs, they aren't antithetical. <coughs> it is the notion of the connectivity that I am attaching, my team is attaching to the sea by virtue of its presence or its absence. Sea can be present or absent. Dispersal is a generic term used for animal and hominin populations where referred to early Paleolithic. Travel is limited to humans. Travel is a cultural and a social reality. 
Both travel and dispersal are affected when sea level fluctuations change land access routes. Stasis, stops, are embedded within travel. Likewise, is adaptation embedded within dispersal? Dispersal, however, is devoid of any cultural meaning. It is biologically driven. So it's not clear when during the Paleolithic the dispersal gives way to travel. We rarely read about traveling Achelians. Perhaps it's about time we did. The linking thread is the Quaternary Sea, now fragmenting the Aegean, now rejoining it. I should close saying that uh, what I have presented to you today is the result of teamwork, is the result of scientific teamwork from Greece and all over the world, is the result of teamwork and hard work conducted by students at all levels in various years. And of course, it has benefited from uh, sponsors and uh, granting uh, bodies. Um, and it's a fixed point in our life. And we hope it to become a fixed point in the history of Greece. Thank you.